Dear ladies and gentlemen, my colleague Dr. Leslie Howard and myself, Dr. Lena Horotko, are delighted to welcome you to Keyboard Trust's new artist recital. We hope this will be one of many as it is Trust's new venture. Through these recitals we hope to support our artists as they have lost so much income uh, in this COVID pandemic. Therefore, we hugely appreciate any support you give Trust's funds, uh, which will go in its entirety to support our artists that play piano, historical keyboards and organ worldwide. We are also very grateful to Steinway Hall for allowing us to use this beautiful mezzanine in the centre of London and of course this magnificent Steinway piano. And now for our artist, homegrown British talent Thomas Kelly. He will play for his first new artist recital, Bozzoni, Sonatina in number no. six, based on Bizet's Carmen. Britain, arranged by Stevenson, Fantasia on themes from Peter Grimes, and Reibke, Piano Sonata in B flat major. After recital, there will be a discussion between Dr. Leslie Howard and Thomas Kelly about this fascinating program. So stay on for that. And now, may I please welcome our artist and thank you all very much for being with us today.
Thomas Kelly, thank you very much for a marvellous recital. It was tremendous to hear those three pieces in concatenation, apart from anything else, which is, there can't be anyone else who's ever done that, I don't think. And um, just a tremendous achievement to play so accurately and so convincingly three such difficult works, which might not be familiar to the public, even though they might know some of the melodies from the, from the two operatic fantasies. And, and poor old Rodka, uh, through absolutely no fault of his own, can't ever become a household word as a composer because there just isn't enough of him. Because the poor chap died from tuberculosis when he was 24 and he was Liszt's pupil. But anyway, um, what they want to hear is all about you. So we were just discussing that you were at the personal school, but uh, tell us the rest. Okay, well, um, there, was a lot, there was a lot of time which came before that, I suppose. Um, I started playing piano when I was three. Um, I think it was quite by chance, because uh, my parents, I think they were always trying to investigate which things I was good at, and I think there, there was one of them. <laughs> um, but um, um, I think that they gave me at that age a sort of this toy piano that was sort of about two octaves or so, and apparently I liked it and everything. Uh, so they made quite a considerable investment, and they brought in an upright piano, and I was very lucky actually that um, I was living in Kent at the time, in Faversham, mm -hmm. and there was a teacher called Michael Bellinfante who was living in the road, uh, literally in the road, and he specialised, he was a piano teacher and he specialised with beginners. So... Very lucky, because what counts is not the great maestro that you go to for a master class. That, that has some influence, but it's the one who forms your, your hands and your body and your mind around the instrument. Well, absolutely. And um, at that age, I remember being very enthusiastic about going to the lessons. He was very uh, extrovert, as I remember, and very enthusiastic. Um, I remember my first lesson, actually, with, uh, when I was three and a half, he took the piano apart in front of me and just showed me like everything that was inside it. And well, uh, well, It's very good, and, and any three and a half year old <laughs> is always pulling his toys apart to see how they work. So it's <laughs> no, well, exactly, and um, I think, and it was all... It went very well with him. I mean, I just basically went a five-minute walk once or even twice a week sometimes to his house. Um, and I sort of went up the grades, the ABRSM grades. Um, one of my first memories, when I first played without the music actually, was in my um, grade three exam, because before then I had never uh, played without the music before but my mother actually had a mis mistake and she left the music on the train when I was going to the exam. And I don't know, I mean, I can't remember ex agreeing to this, but apparently I was asked if I wanted to go into the exam anyway. And I said yes. And Good I, for you. I played without the music, but then the problem with that was, was that I could never play with the music in public again after this. Well, it is a funny thing that pianists are expected most of the time to play from memory. And no one else is, except, well, opera singers are, but uh, there's plenty of stuff going on around them, apart from a text as well as the music, for, for them to remember. And, and with, a, with a piano, you're out there, and if you've got even the slightest curiosity as a composer or an arranger or anything, you know perfectly well that it could go like this or it could go like this. And everybody's terror that I've ever met is the spot where the first time it goes that way and the second time it goes that way. And if you go that way the first time, then it's a very short sonata. And if you go that way the second time, it's a very long one. And, and it's, 
it's partly though because when you're playing a piece that is as busy as the sonata that you just played, I mean, imagine the crick in your neck you'd get if you were trying to follow every single semiquaver of that on the paper while you were playing it. It's very, very hard to do that. Um, some people do take the music into recording sessions. Really? Um, okay. Yes. Um, it depends how much repertoire you've got to get through, whether you can play it all comfortably from uh, memory, but then of course there are so many things that can happen in a recording session that make you have to do things again. Um, like birds, um, Farmer Dan's tractor, um, ambulance sirens, police, uh, anything like that, or, or, or the Ministry of Defence f doing a bit of low flying. Uh, I've had all of those. Um, <laughs> because we don't really have purpose-built studios for recording classical music. They've all mostly been taken over by the popular music industry. And um, uh, it's just the way it is. And so uh, we have to deal with it, but um, but pl but memory is something that well, it's handy. But you know, not everybody. It, it, it's not in the tradition of the instrument from the beginning to play from memory. Well, yes, and uh, I mean, memory has always been the most the thing I got most nervous about about performing. Uh, I always enjoy bringing the music that I've prepared to the general public. I really enjoy performing in general. Uh, just this fear of getting lost, I suppose it, I remember uh, also when I was you know, first doing sonata, sonata movements in festivals and yeah. obviously this dreaded slip of going or one of the, the wrong way. Um, I suppose over time, you know, picking up the theory at Purcell School and everything and really ingraining exactly where everything is held. Well, it, that it, it is very encouraging of you to have learned the structure of things because that's what makes memory more secure. If you really know how the thing was put together, you know that when the, when the subject's about to be inverted, when it's going to be augmented, when it's going to be played backwards, all of that sort of thing, you learn the basic blocks the, the key structure, there are all sorts of things that you can do to hang on to something. Um, and then you still you have to go hunting for the bits that either seem illogical, uh, which sometimes happens, um, you know, just for our argument's sake, playing a Granados and Squareskos from memory is quite difficult because there's such an air of improvisation about it. Well, yeah. There are so many places where you could go from there to there, um, and plenty of people do. <laughs> but, um, but if you're playing something that <coughs> is a bona fide sonata, that's, it's usually written in a way that tells its own story, and, and you would know that you'd lost the narrative if you, if you went on to <coughs> any, any stray path. These um, operatic fantasies that you played today, isn't it marvellous that Brazzoni didn't go for writing a war horse that ended with slam bam thank you bam, you know? He, he, well, he, exactly. he, he did something else which tells you what, you know, of the essential misery of the story, because it is a, it's a very sad story. And yeah, it's, so it's full of misunderstanding and human fallibility and everything else. And, 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 he, and he, he makes it all so warm because he puts Michaela, uh, her aria, because she's the nicest character in the opera, <laughs> puts her at the beginning. Yes. <laughs> and it's downhill all the way emotionally <laughs> after that. And, and it ends as bleak as, as I can't think of any other operatic fantasy that risks such you know, uh, a bleak ending as that. I think it's just well, amazing. I, I think it's so true to the spirit of the opera. It certainly I mean, is, isn't it? So different to almost any common fantasy I can think of. Oh, well, you know, all the ones with the violin where... Oh, the violin where, ones. Where, where, where the tunes yeah. get completely lost in the shuffle, but uh, but you get to hear, hear more do double stops in three minutes than you've heard in a lifetime. And, uh, yeah, no, that, that, that's, that's... It was, it was just too tempting for people to uh, 
No, but I think that um, I think it's the character of the opera suits what I understand so far of Busoni very well because um, Andrew Ball, my professor, he was the one who uh, seriously introduced me to the composer, and before then, actually, I think. I sort of had a general impression from the outside that he was this transcriber of Bach who sounded occasionally slightly weird or strange uses of harmony, but of course now, the more I've delved into it, the more it's so such imagination. Um, in this piece, it's like, in some of the uh, joining episodes, the voices, everything is just so important. Well, he's, and he's very good at uh, overlapping themes and making themes fit together, and uh, and the, this goes for all of his original compositions as well. He's exactly. just, he's just a, a very good contrapuntist. And uh, I mean, uh, the Toccata um, I, is another piece that I really like. Good. And um, it was, although it was challenging to memorize, it was very challenging to memorize. But once I memorized it, it's like it just stuck because everything is so well put together and well, it just fits in sort of his own way. Well, let, let me know when you memorise the Fantasia Contrapuntistica. Because <laughs> that's, a, that's a hurdle. The Piano oh. Concerto is easier to memorise than that. Well, I've looked at both of the scores and I would agree and I've not <laughs> tried either of them yet. <laughs> yeah. and, and, the, and the Peter Grimes fantasy, it's very good, isn't it, that this tradition of writing a piano piece that gets at the at the guts of an opera uh, hasn't died out. Um, even more recently, um, do you know Tom Addis's fantasy on his own opera, Powder Your Face? Powder Her Face. I have heard of it. Yeah, I, I mean, know. I've everything I've seen of Thomas Addis' compositions, I've thought is extremely admirable. It's very, very complicated. Uh, it is very complicated, but you know, he's he's actually done it on his own work, but. Yes, he's um, he synthesizes the opera in in a, a very special way, yeah. and um, it, there are elements in the, in the fantasy that are not even in the opera, but um, that's okay. He's the composer; he can do what he likes. Uh, but uh, Ronald Stevenson also didn't try to make any kind of blood and thunder paraphrase out of it. It's a very difficult piece, as we all know, but, uh, but uh, you know, it's, it's another opera that is completely miserable, full of people who misunderstand and people who um, persecute somebody without knowing what they're talking about or doing. And uh, Well, yes, and I suppose this kind of motif that goes right from the first page of this uh, Peter Grimes, yes. of this rhythm, uh, the way it just keeps coming back through, and even in, in the cadenza, it's sort of not any old cadenza. No, either. no, it's not. Yeah. Oh, that's that's terrific. And uh, what next for you? Well, virus um, permitting. <laughs> I mean, who knows what's going to be happening in three weeks? So, um, I'm. I mean, I've been now studying with Andrew Ball. For this is started my sixth year with him, and I'm but you're ex very, very extremely lucky to happy be with such a good good teacher as that. I couldn't. Yes, I couldn't. Um, just over the years, I've realised exactly oh, how yeah. lucky I am, and um, I'm just very happy to stay with him for as long as good. his health permits. To be honest, um, I'm very happy in the Royal College of Music. Um, uh, where are you, just for the ski, for, for, for the benefit of the viewers, as they say? Oh yes. Uh, well, I am studying at the uh, Royal College of Music, uh, undergraduate. Uh, I'm on my fourth year. Okay. Uh, so I've got my um, master's audition coming up. Um, I mean, I certainly. You know, I'm just hoping for the best with everything. Um, as far as competitions are concerned, they're not my favourite thing. The trouble with competitions is that they want everybody to play the same 20 pieces. 
and if you win playing the same 20 pieces then that's fine but otherwise it's not so fine because if you just play those 20 pieces that everybody else plays it's much harder to get work uh, you know because of course you can play the great masterpieces and the pe pieces that everybody knows they're good to hear but yes. to make a, a, an interesting program you need pieces like you just played in this recital and you need to to make a balance with them and to, and to carve yourself out a repertoire that looks like you uh, is, a, is a difficult thing to do if every competition says well you're going to play a Beethoven sonata and you're going to play a Bach pretty and few and a Chopin etude and a Liszt etude and all of this stuff um, I wish if they were going to have competitions at all that they would let the choice of repertoire be absolutely free. Well exactly I mean I completely agree and but then even then they're just under so much pressure these days with all this live streaming on Medici yes. you can s every movement is under scrutiny and I can understand those people who do just want to play their safest safest well, prelude and fugue and their safest etudes. It's perfectly true and everybody knows that in many competitions the people who do well are the ones who offend the smallest number of people but that doesn't make them the most interesting players and they're not always the ones who emerge in the long run and, and you can check that one out by just looking at the list of all the people who've won competitions in the last 50 60 years well yes and of course there are some fabulous names in there but there are other names that you are uh, hand on heart have to say who and uh, <laughs> Well, exactly, yeah. and uh, I mean, I think I think I can see that competitions certainly have their place as a root pathway, but just on the other hand, I've never wanted to be entering, f you know, many of them. Just occasionally, if there's one that I particularly want to do. Well, if, um, if you enter a good one and win it, uh, it certainly helps. But yes. but because there are so many of them there will be a next winner of that competition pretty soon after on your heels. Yes. So you have to make absolutely everything out of any gig that comes out of them. I remember, I remember a, an, uh, a pianist who I met once who's a good bit older than me and he was saying that from his experience, I mean exactly as you said, that there's always the next winner and they also they are quite often so fully booked for a year that it's difficult for anybody to keep up with that. Yeah, it's very hard, and then there are then there are gigs that you would like to play, and they say, no, we've got that reserved for the winner of the competition that hasn't taken place yet. <laughs> so uh, it's it's not one of the great times in history to go for this career, which means that if you are going for it, then you have to be absolutely committed to doing it. Well, I think. I mean, certainly, as far as the music's concerned, I feel absolutely committed. I mean... That's very clear from your playing, which you are, don't worry. <laughs> um, thank you, and um, I'm, tr I'm interested in many av avenues within. I'm not only... I mean, I, I really want to uh, explore the solo repertoire that I, I want to play. Also, um, concertos, obviously, chamber music I like. Good. Um, my sight reading, because on what we touched on earlier, it's sort of I've always been more natural at sight reading and less natural with memory. Well, that's that happens, and if you're a good piano player and you're a good sight reader, you will always be the one who gets asked to play the Hindemith Horn Sonata. And uh, I never accompany Hindemith. <laughs> well, and no, they're they're very good for you. I promise you. They are. <laughs> Back in the day, I th I think I played every Hindemith Sonata that there was, uh, <laughs> because you know they if you play the Cor and you need to play a sonata. The list of them is quite short. I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> well, <Wow. laughs> and there's always one by Paul Hindemith. <laughs> yes, um, well, and but, but I mean, what with um, I suppose I've over time and since Purcell, I've just been gradually introduced to more and more sort of viol violin duo repertoire, cello du cello repertoire. Um, I've started. It's a very unpromising time to start, as you say, but I'm trying to start a trio in good. college at the moment. Nice repertoire. And in between, 
if you ever get the opportunity to accompany singers, grab it. Um, and while you're at it, try and learn the rudiments of at least a couple of foreign languages. I don't know if you've studied any, but uh, they come in handy. Certainly. And most pianists I know who've ever done any song accompaniment learn a great deal that they didn't think they were going to learn about phrasing, breathing, shaping of things. Because well, singers absolutely concentrate on that. And they do it, on the whole, better than piano players do because they, they also relax their shoulders better and they relax their jaws better. And um, because piano players really like, you know, they're, they're not even aware when they're getting tense and putting their knee up on the other side of the, <laughs> of the keyboard and all that. Well, exactly, and I, I mean, I was, I just, uh, I agreed to accompany sexually to English songs in college last year, and I just suddenly found how much more, I mean, I don't know, it's obviously the parts are all difficult, but I mean, um, there was, I noticed this added challenge that I suddenly felt slightly out of my depth, because I just... Well, you, I, yeah. you snap up every opportunity you can. Definitely. Thanks for talking to us. We wish you oh. enormously well. And uh, the Keyboard Trust, I'm sure, will be looking out to see what we can do to help. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you very Thanks. much.